Good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, this is Steve Larson with the Horns Dairyman staff, and we're welcoming you to uh, our March webinar featuring Dr. David Reed, and he's going to be talking about saving time and money in the parlor. And uh, our webinar today is brought to us by the Best in Class Dairies uh, program uh, from Muriel, good friends there that uh, have been regular sponsors for our webinar series, and we appreciate that very much. And since there's a lot of ground going to be covered today, I'm going to turn this over to Mike Hutchins, who's actually this today sitting right beside me at the Orange Dairyman <coughs> offices to introduce our uh, speaker and uh, get this webinar rolling. Very good, Steve. Well, listen, uh, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to, to, uh, to introduce a, a professional friend of mine, and that's Dr. David Reed. David Reed operates uh, Rocky Ridge Dairy Consulting. Uh, he's got 39 ex years of experience in the milk quality milk machine area as far as that goes. Besides uh, his getting his uh, degree at Kansas State University, he grew up uh, in, the, in the Wisconsin area as far as that goes, and uh, worked for a number of years with Bomatic in Madison as Director of Milk Harvest Science and Technology. So he brings a wealth of experience with it. He received numerous awards, which we won't read to, but an impressive list of awards from industry, from, and from, from other areas as far as that goes. So Dr. Reed, we are so pleased to have you here today, and we uh, turn the program over to you. Well, thanks, Mike, and, and uh, the rest of the staff. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity uh, to be part of this, this program. And we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, part of management and, uh, and probably uh, some areas that I think are important are, you know, how you handle your cows, how you prep your cows, and how you take care of your parlor. Because, frankly, I see a lot of issues on, on farms uh, when I travel around to do farm evaluations. So remember, milking time is harvest time. And I always try to tell people, is there a difference between milking cows and harvesting food? And in my mind, there clearly is a difference. And we need to always be aware that we are processing food and harvesting food when we're in that part of milking. And we need to be thinking about what we would want or how we would want our food handled as we move. Now, there's a lot of principles of milk quality that have been around for a very, very long time. Uh, things like keep your cows clean, dry, and comfortable between milkings. I mean, tremendous amount of literature that's been produced about that. And milk clean, dry, stimulated teats. I think many of us understand that concept of having clean teats and that post-dip is an absolute cornerstone of milk quality. And then if we think about the, the equipment itself, it's maintaining it and then analyzing it on a set schedule so that it's actually performing well. And then when we get into we realize that we're always going to have mastitis. So how do we handle those clinical cases? We pull them out of the line immediately. We treat those cows with an appropriate therapy. Uh, we withhold the milk and the meat if they go to slaughter. And then eventually we cull chronic cows. People understand this. But, you know, one of the things that I see when I, when I look at farms is most producers have a good working knowledge of those principles. But then I see dairies, they violate as many of those as possible and still want quality milk. So if we look at... Look at this next slide. So I call this guy, or he calls me, and he's having an issue. And I said, do you use pre-dip in your dairy? And the answer was yes. So that's the first picture. Second picture is taken from the front sides, and we see the coverage on the teats. And so although he told me we're using pre-dip, when I look at how they're using it, it's not going to do an appropriate job because it's not covering the entire teat prior to the time that our preparation begins. So then, you know, when I thought talk to the same producer and he tells me that we only have two people in our two double fourteens. We milk in a seven cow group and they don't help one another. And of course I'm in the parlor for five minutes and I take a picture with all three people lined up attaching units at the same place at the start of the parlor. Which tells me that even though the protocol may be written down, that protocol is not being followed on a dairy. And this is a major problem on dairies and it's not related to the size of the dairy. It happens in tie stall barns and small parlors, as well as it happens in large commercial operations similar to this one with two double fourteens. So if we look at some of the principles of how we milk cows, there's there's one of the probably the only original thing I've ever come up with was the word milkability. And that to me is that if we prep the cow properly, uh, almost immediately after we attach the unit, we can hear the, the bleed hole in the claw or the bleed holes in the individual liners 
starting to make a characteristic hissing sound that, that tells us that there's milk flowing. So milk flows rapidly or begins to rise rapidly. Uh, there's a high flow achieved very quickly. The cow maintains that flow for whatever the amount of milk she's given. It abruptly starts to slow down and almost immediately the unit's removed. And then during the time that that cow's being milked, she has her feet planted on the platform. She's not kicking. She's not moving. She's not having any behavior issues during milking. And when the unit comes off, the cow is completely milked out. In other words, there's minimal stripping milk left, and she milked out evenly. And so when we think about this, the cornerstone of milk ability is to remove the milk quickly, gently, and completely from the cow. That's our goal. And if we look at an individual flow pattern from a dairy cow, we see that that flow starts up early, stays at a peak for a certain period of time, begins to come down, and then it's in a period of relatively low flow. So when, we think in, when we're thinking about parlor management and what we're doing in our parlor, there's two times that we have this particularly problem area, which is low flow. It can occur at the front end of milking if the udder prep is not proper or it's not timed properly to take advantage of what the pro preparation process is. And it can also occur at the far end of milking if the detachers and equipment aren't adjusted properly to remove the unit when the cow's done milking. So our game plan is always to reduce those periods of time when there's low flow. And the reason is because milk flow and vacuum level are inverse. In other words, whatever the system vacuum setting is, when milk flow is very low, that vacuum will be that vacuum on the system will be very close to what's being what can be measured in the claw of the cow. So in most cases, it's going to be a higher vacuum. So low flow equals high vacuum. High vacuum <clears throat> is a period of time when we can have an issue with a cow. <clears throat> so if we look at the, the letdown response, <clears throat> I think most of us understand that if we manipulate the teats of the cow, sends a message to the brain of the cow, the brain then causes a message to go to the pituitary gland and release a hormone called oxytocin. And then oxytocin is transmitted in the bloodstream to the heart and then basically out to the lungs, back to the heart, and eventually to the udder. And when it gets to the udder, it causes a contraction of smooth muscles that surround the actual milk secreting cells called alveoli. So when we get the good oxytocin letdown, <clears throat> we get this contraction, and then we have full milk letdown. <clears throat> so when we look at this from a timing point of view, the, uh, it takes 10 to 12 seconds of contact time on the teats to establish good oxytocin letdown. So contact time is defined really as the time that, our, that a person in the parlor is either stripping cows, manipulating the teats, rubbing the teat ends, washing the teats, or using a towel to dry the teats. It's the actual time of touching. <clears throat> so if we need 10 to 12 seconds of contact time, typically it's going to take somewhere between 15 to 20 seconds of actual time under the cow. Because remember, True contact time is only when the teats are being touched. So based on the physiology of the cow, if we get that 10 to 12 seconds of contact time, then approximately 90 seconds later, the cow will have, most cows will have reached full milk letdown potential. And our game then would be to put the unit on the cow approximately 90 seconds, or if it's going to be either below 90 or above 90, we're going to go slightly longer than 90 to attach the units to the cows. And then, clearly, we want to keep those cows and the milk harvest technicians calm at all times. It's extremely important from the point of view of this letdown effect on the cow. And also remember that the half-life of oxytocin is between four and six minutes. So if your cows are taking longer than six minutes to milk or they're approaching six-minute milking times, that graph I showed of the way the milk flow decreases toward the end of milking will have a fairly long period of low flow. And remember, low flow means that the vacuum at the claw and in the teat end is going to be higher than it would be if the cow's under normal milk flow. And that high vacuum period is where we do some damage to the teat and we cause more stretching and more cracking of the teat skin, which can lead to hyperkeratosis and which makes teats much more difficult to clean. So when we think about the stimulation of the teat, not only do the nerves and the teat skin send a message to the brain, 
but they also cause the sphincter muscle to dilate slightly and the teat ducts. So in other words, when the teats are manipulated during the process of preparation, cows will milk faster. And then there's also these nerves that go, that stimulate the myeloepithelial cells from the teat skin, which makes them more susceptible to the oxytocin. So with manipulation of the teats, you're going to get cows that milk faster. And that's an inherent problem on a lot of dairies because in, in many dairies, people want to get the units attached as quickly as possible so they can milk more cows or get done in a timely manner. One of the common misconceptions is that people just want to attach units to go faster. What we really want to do is slow down to go faster because if we slow down, have the right timing, now the cow will let her milk down properly, she'll milk quicker, which means that we can milk more cows in the parlor. <clears throat> so we've been talking about non-conditioned teat uh, stimulation. That's where we touch the teats physically. But there's also a conditioned effect of milk letdown, and that is, uh, what does the cow see? What does she hear or experience both shortly before milking, right up through the milking process? So the more constant that is, the better it is. And we know that consistent handling and consistent procedures will result in the best overall throughput of a parla. And remember this, that if a cow has an adrenaline release within a half hour of milking, in other words, her ears come up, she looks around, she's like scared of something or she's anticipating what's around the corner, then that cow will not milk out properly irregardless of the other prep. The adrenaline that's released into that cow's bloodstream will override the effect of the oxytocin. So we always want to be aware of how those cows are moved to the parlor, and then not only that, but how they're handled in the, in the parlor itself. <clears throat> so a question I ask dairymen oftentimes is, which cows milk best in your parlor? And I get a lot of different answers. But if you think about this, it's the cows that are in the front part of the parlor, if it's a side-by-side -side parlor, that typically milk the best. Because those are the cows that enter the parlor on their own. They want to be there because they want to be milked out. And watch how well those cows milk compared to some of the cows at the back of the parlor, in particular toward the end of a larger pen, where those cows have been run into the parlor. Maybe someone's been relatively aggressive with them or whistled at them or maybe even hit them to get them into the parlor. And then watch how those cows milk. There's a distinct difference in where you're at in the parlor. And this is a quote from Graham Mean that uh, was presented at NMC a good number of years ago. And, and his point was, never forget that machine milking is a unique example of a mechanical process that requires the willing cooperation of the cow to be completed successfully. And that goes back to this adrenaline issue. Because if that cow has the adrenaline release, she will not milk out properly. So it's not only in the parlor, <clears throat> but it's how those cows are brought out of a holding pen or from the living pens to the holding pen and then on into the parlor. So having a proper cow moving protocol it is an important aspect of uh, making your parlor more efficient. So this next picture now is a graph made with a, with a lactocorder, which is an electronic milk meter. And, and what we're looking at here is the fact that this cow started out with very low flow, came up to about six pounds a minute, and then basically stopped. So the meter makes a graph that says it's coming down gradually, but that's just the milk that was in the system as it went through the sensor. And then if you look at the time frame from here over to here, we're looking at probably almost a half a minute with no milk flow. So in other words, this unit was put on a cow that was not properly stimulated with manipulation of the teats for 10 to 12 seconds. So when we see what happened, if we had prepped this cow properly, look, the flow rate goes up, stays up like this, and then drops down at the same level, and we may have taken a minute off of milking at the end by not having this 30 seconds of no milk flow at the front end of milking. Now, this was in a dairy in California that I was at several years ago that basically had a wash pen, and if the cows came in clean, there was no further udder prep. They just attached units. So this is a, another graph from the same dairy where I stripped three streams of milk from each teat and then waited 90 seconds and attached the unit. And so notice how much, how much quicker milk flow goes up it stays around the same level. And the other side of it, it, it comes down quicker. So when cows have a good letdown, we speed up the rise to peak milk flow, <clears throat> and we also speed the drop back to minimal or no flow. 
And remember, the periods of low flow are when we have relatively high vacuum exposure to teats, which can and do cause damage to teats. And if you think about many of the parlors that, that are around the country, one of the things we see is a lot of cows do a lot of stepping and moving during the preparation process and also toward the end of milking. And in fact, in many parlors we see what I call cow-assisted takeoffs. That means just when the unit starts to come off the cow, that cow is kicking at the unit as it's being uh, retracted from the cow. Those are not normal behaviors. Typically, we can fix many of those behaviors with just more consistent and, and more, not only more consistent, but proper udder preparation. So there is a difference between milking routine and procedures. And when we look at the procedures, the procedures, in, from my definition, are what we do to milk one cow. So the example that I've shown on the slide is that there would be dip, strip, dry, and apply. Then the routine would be, how are we going to prep multiple cows in a parlor? So one common way of doing it in a lot of large parlors is sequential. So one person starts down doing a specific task, maybe dipping. And then when that person gets to a certain distance down the parlor, then another person begins to, to strip. And then maybe another person drives and another person applies. The, the units to the cows. Probably the most common one we see on more and more dairies is a group where one milk harvest technician is responsible for all procedures on a given number of cows. And then rarely, occasionally, and that, I say quite rarely, where we have a true territorial where um, it may be a double 16 parlor and one person milks in the front eight and one person milks in the back eight and they, they probably work in a grouping situation in that, situ in that kind of a parlor. But it's not a very common one. So when we look at the routines, the best consistency is we have group or territorial where one person is in charge of all aspects of prepping a certain group of cows. It's very difficult to keep the right distances in sequential milking, although you can attach units quickly. But remember, this is harvest time. And if you attach units too quickly, you cause high milking or high milking vacuum at the front of milking which causes the liner to crawl up on the teat, partially block off the upper door of the teat, and that impacts your overall milk yield. So the goal would be to prep cows properly so you can harvest the maximum amount of milk. Uh, now, when we look at these routines, if we go back to that slide once and say dip, strip, dry, and apply, and the, the procedures, and then we look at the routine, the routine is going to be based on what are the procedures being used, and then how big is the parlor, and how many operators are there. And remember the rules, 10 to 12 seconds of contact time, followed by attaching the units at as uh, close to 90 seconds as possible. And if you have to error, you error on the long slide slightly so that you have all units on by two and a half minutes. Those are would be the rules. And by using those rules, you're actually working with the physiology of the cow to help maximize the milk yield. So what I find on a lot of dairies is we have situations where even in a grouping routine where the milk harvest technicians actually are going very fast because they've been coached to get cow's milk. One of the things I do in those dairies is to change the routine so that the teat contact pro parts of the protocol or the procedures are all done at one stop on the cow. So in this example that I've listed, it's a five cow group and it's a dip, strip, dry, and apply. So what we're going to do is we're going to suggest that the, the uh, technician, in this case it was a sand barn, and it's a barn that I've worked in fairly recently. So we had him take a clean towel, rub the teats aggressively to remove sand, and apply the pre -dip. They were also told that if there's manure on any teats, as they went to that cow, they'd apply pre -dip, strip it off very quickly, and remove the sand, and then re-dip the cow. Then they would take another clean towel to go to sand removal for the rest of the cows in the group. So now the technician goes back to the first cow, and then they're going to go and rub each teat with three up and down motions with the gloved hand, which is the, the three four fingers and a thumb, then two aggressive motions across the end of the teat, washing it, and then stripping the cow. And then immediately, after they've done all four teats that way, immediately take a towel and dry the cow. And they're going to dry with one circular motion on each teat, flip the towel, and then go ahead and pinch each teat end aggressively. 
Now, one of the things I do in side by side parlance is I always I try to have all of these root procedures done in the same order. In other words, start with the left front, right front, right rear, left rear teats. I don't care how it works, but I believe you should do the front teats first so that you avoid contamination, in particular when you're drying the last teats that you don't have your sleeve or arm across a clean teat end. In a herringbone parlor, it would be just the far teats first and then the close teats. And in a given order that's arrived at on that dairy, again, remembering that the more consistent the procedure, the better is going to be the overall letdown. And remember that the most critical part about a preparation is drying. So it's dry with one circular motion, like the picture on the left. After all four teats are done, flip the towel and go back and aggressively rub the teat in. An aggressive rubbing, I know when I worked at Fomatic, someone, one of the people in marketing said, we can't put that in print. And I said, well, if you go to a dairy, put your fingers in a calf's mouth and feel what it feels like. That calf puts those papillas on the tongue on your finger, and it's very aggressive. What we're trying to do by being aggressive is to remove any material that's lodged at the end of the teeth. And also, by making that aggressive motion, you send a better stimulation or be a better signal to stimulate the letdown of oxytocin. So when I look at dairies, you know, it's train the, the milk harvest technicians, then evaluate them on a regular basis, but more importantly, coach them. And coaching is the thing that I think uh, many dairies don't do. Coaching means that we want to do we want to do follow-up with our, with our technicians in the parlor on a regular basis, and we want to motivate them to do the proper things every time they milk a cow. And motivation is the thing that coaches are, successful coaches are good motivators. They motivate people to do things the right way, even maybe when they're not with them on the field, if you look at the sporting world. So the game plan is to go ahead and coach our people better than we have in the past. And I find on a lot of large dairies that there's no one individual that's been designated to work in the parlor. So a parlor manager, someone who would be involved with training, evaluating, and coaching the milk harvest technicians, as well as coordinating the scheduling of the parlor for who works at what shift, and also they could also be the person that's the, the go-between between the milk and equipment dealer and any maintenance personnel on the dairy that are going to handle the normal maintenance of the milk and equipment. So one of the common problems on a dairy is illustrating these two pictures. The one on the right is easy. There was a nasty ring developed on the teat, and that teat didn't milk. But look at the picture on the left. This is from a very high-producing herd of cows, over 90 pounds on 1,500 cows per day. And look at the amount of milk in the right rear teat. And this is an, this is an issue with if, units are, if, if cows are uh, not properly prepped and units are attached, even in high-producing cows, prior to the time of good letdown, and possibly the unit's not properly adjusted under the cow to be square when viewed from the back and from the side, then we get into these situations of uneven milk cow. And we shouldn't see the kind of rings that we see on this one cow. That's basically due to where the liner crawled onto the teat, then we had no flow, high exposure to vac or exposure to high vacuum for a short period of time, which causes the, the tissues to swell and then milk flow does not occur out of that teat in a normal manner. So what are some things we can do to get better performance in our parlor? You know, the first one is as soon as a cow is in a position at a stall in a barn where other preparation can begin, someone should start to prep her. In other words, don't fill the whole side of the parlor. Don't fill if, it's, if one person's going to milk eight or ten cows in the front. Don't get the all eight or ten in if you're in a five or a four cow sequence. As soon as those cows start and in turn, begin to prep. And then as soon as the last group is being prepped, the rest of the technicians in the parlor should be on the opposite side, applying post-tip, exiting cows, and having cows start back into the parlor. Now, many newer systems in the country have what's known as maximum unit on time option. In other words, this is a, if they have meters then or milk recording devices, then that automation can be set to only milk a certain amount of time. In other words, the button is pushed to attach at a certain set point in time, that unit's going to come off irregardless of milk flow. Now what, what we normally do on dairies is we start fairly long on those and gradually work those down, looking at the data from the milk meter reports on the dairy and saying, okay, where should we be? And, and what we're going to do is pull off some of those units at a timed 
setting. In some cases, on some dairies, the lowest ones I've ever had have been about six and a half minutes, but many dairies are in the seven to seven and a half minute range, at which time the unit's going to manually detach. Now, in a parlor that doesn't have automation with meters, it's very simple. If the, if the parlor is a double 24, the rule may be when there's two cows left and they're not milking much, we're going to detach those units and move. Now, you might argue that we're leaving a little milk, but one of the things that we're going to ask that dairy to do before they implement this is to have consistent udder prep so that we can get the good udder prep at the beginning and good milk letdown. We're going to train those cows and condition those cows to milk quickly. And then we're going to take the unit off before we really hurt them. So if we look at the goals, it's you know milk high producing cows cleanly, rapidly, gently, and completely. You know, detach as soon as milk flow ceases, and then get another cow calmly into that stall as soon as possible. That's the goal. So when we think of that, you know, how we move those animals to the holding pen and into the parlor is extremely important. Recently, there's been uh, several articles in the lay literature and, and at several uh, professional meetings talking about stockmanship for the dairy personnel. And handling cows properly is a huge is a huge issue on a lot of cow on a lot of dairies and when it's done properly, we minimize the yelling, we make the parlor much calmer, and if the people are calm, the cows will be calm. And then think about some of the things we could do to automate crowd gates. You know, the controls are such that if, if, if there's a PLC that can be wired into it, then we can do all kinds of things. And one of the things I'll do on dairies is when we want that crowd gate to move, when we punch that button, and in particular in some dairies where we program it to move so far when we move the button, when we touch the button once, if we start the gate, move it away for a second, stop it, then move it forward for the prescribed amount of time to move X number of cows toward the parlor, then stop the gate, then start it again and back it up. By doing that, it takes the pressure off the cows in the holding pen. In other words, cows aren't braced against the holding gate, which relaxes those cows. And very shortly, they'll be conditioned to the sound of that crowd gate operation, and when they hear it start, they know it's going to go away. Now it's going to ask them to go to the parlor. Simple things like this can be done to many, many uh, crowd gates around the country, which would dramatically improve parlor performance and the ability to have cows calmly into the parlor. And then when we have calm cows, we have relatively clean cows. And what I always look at is how much manure splatter is that on the rear sides of the front legs. Not only there, but also on the floor of the udder. So this is a sand-based barn, and these are pretty good. There's a little bit on manure and, and the cows out in the farther part of the picture, but very little. So when we look at this, if it's really wet, they picked up that manure splash on the way to the parlor. If most of that manure splash is very dry, it was picked up on the way out of the parlor, and it's had a chance to dry before they came back to the parlor. So look at your cows, and then go out and look at your facilities and say, how can we minimize the manure splash that occurs? We want to bring those cows clean to the barn. And then go back and look at where your cows enter the parlor. So in this picture you can see that when we look back here, you know, here's the hip of the cow, and if that cow comes in and bangs into that pipe, think about what happens, well, how you feel if you bang your elbow on a, on a hard surface. You, it is not, it, it is very painful, and it will interfere with milk letdown. So we want to look at how can we make these parlors friendly for the cow entry. The more friendly it is for cows, the better the cows are going to let their milk down, and the more willing they'll come into the parlor. So here's an example of a rotary. And you can see that there's some posts here. And I took this picture. The alleyway is actually too wide. And when I took this picture, the cow that's in the foreground, the, the, the whole cow, she was back farther. The cow on the left over here put her head up against her and pushed her quickly. And she hit this corner post right here. And you can still see the arch in her back from where this hip bone hit this pipe. And remember, now as soon as this is a rotary, so as soon as this cow goes on and gets to this position, the technician is going to be again to apply either pre-dip or foam or some kind of sanitation product on the teats, and that animal is in the process of being stripped. So there's going to be a negative letdown because of the pain that's induced into that cow from hitting pipes. So think about what your parlors look like when you go home from this. One of the best things to do is shield them. And if you note this one, is this is a rotary as well, but it's shielded with plastic so that the posts are completely covered with plastic. So this cow, if she's moving against that plastic, 
is not going to hit any part of her bony structures of her hips onto an upright post. Again, that's going to make those cows come into the parlor calmly, and it's going to come in without the adrenaline letdown that will interfere with milk letdown. So even side-by-side -side parlors, <clears throat> by shielding these parlors, we're going to get better cow entry in. And in particular, on the opposite sides of this, where the cows are exiting, we want to shield those as well, because oftentimes a cow that's leaving the parlor can stand in that location and intimidate cows from moving into the parlor. And remember, cows by nature will go single file if they walk in a pasture. All we're doing is trying to take advantage of that in our parlors and say, put up white plastic, have it very bright, don't have the yelling, don't have the whistling, don't have the screaming at the cows, and have those cows follow their herd mates into the parlor. That's our game plan. <clears throat> Another thing we want to do is think about where we can improve the, the uh, movement of cows into the barn. And, and oftentimes, under the cows in the parlor is the best place to put rubber. It's going to improve the uh, walking time into the parlor. Cows will walk with more, they'll walk off with a lot more confidence on rubber. So normally what I do is put it in the parlor. I put it in the return lanes because that's where cows wear their hooves. And then I'll put it in the front part of the holding pen to say to the cows, okay, keep moving towards the front. You'll get on the rubber. You'll get on the rubber in the parlor, and then you can exit back on the rubber to get back to, to being a cow in the freestyle park. So here's an example of how cows come down an alleyway. This has got concrete. It's quite rough. And notice that cow is actually moving her feet in an outward position that can wear off the heels. So rubber here is a big, is a big deal for minimizing hoof wear. And then in the parlor, this is a parlor that was undergoing a retro the day I took this picture. So we, they were putting rubber only under where the cows stand in the parlor. And remember, we want those cows to come in. This is a, in particular of importance in a parallel parlor. Because in a parallel parlor, those cows have to make a twisting motion on their rear feet so that they're positioned properly. And if you think about parlors, when I'm in parlors, the rougher the concrete, the less the cows stand parallel to one another in a parallel parlor. Because they, they get some pain in their feet when they're trying to get in a right position, and they stop. And then it makes it very difficult to get the unit properly aligned under the cow. So rubber in a parlor. Now, there are a few places in the U.S. You've got to be careful because some milk inspectors don't allow it. But I think we can make the case to those people that rubber will improve the overall cow welfare and, and allow uh, us to use rubber in parlors makes a huge difference. And here's another example where this is an exit alley now where the cows, are, they've got some rubber in the front that's going to guide those cows down through the exit alley. And you can see the concrete here. Normally I would go back a little farther and put rubber in the front of that pen. All of that use of rubber is going to improve cow movement into, uh, into uh, the parlor. So another thing we talk about is being clean. So let's get the hair off. In this case, we're going to use a torch to fire the udders. Same barn, we're moving the hair off. Here we are in a, in a parallel, in a herringbone parlor, where we're actually going to notice that the technician has a glove on. The torch has been modified. It has a yellow flame under the cow. He keeps the torch moving at all times to remove the hair. By doing that, we're going to get rid of the hair. This is a rotary uh, with a torch that has an alcohol-based torch underneath and back on a steel rod. Here's the same kind of a torch being applied in a, in a parallel barn. Notice this is right before milking. I mean, these, these cows have full udders. It's done very regular, and it doesn't bother the cows. This is the technique that I use quite frequently, and this is where we're using a spray bottle that's, uh, that's filled with alcohol. So it's a WD-40 bottle, and that's just simply because the WD-40 bottles will stand up to the alcohol. They have rubber components that won't, won't be uh, uh, deteriorated by the alcohol. And we typically use a 70% alcohol, not 99, and a torch. So basically, we spray the alcohol under the cow, bring the torch up, and light it. And this is a large dairy that does this every two weeks. Uh, by doing this, number one thing that happens is cows come to the barn cleaner. Number two is the attitude of the milk harvest technicians gets better because we're now going ahead and bringing cleaner cows into the parlor for them to work on it every milk. And again, when we're done, that hair just looks like it just brushes right off and we're going to have much cleaner cows. So milking cows rapidly. We want that high flow rate you know, during the entire period of attachment. So if you have meters, and if it's hooked to dairy comp, or if you get a report from your 
particular company that sold you that equipment, we look for two-minute milk. In other words, how much milk is produced in the first two minutes? So for a 3X dairy, it should be at least 14 and a half pounds or more, and 18 and a half pounds or more, 18 to 18 and a half pounds on a 2X dairy. And when we look at average flow, it should be six and a half pounds or more on a 3X dairy, and eight and a half pounds or more on a 2X dairy. And these numbers, if you're not, if you don't have meters, you could still go check what I call some sentinel cows, some of your favorite cows. If you DHI test every month, when that unit goes on, stop the watch, start a stopwatch, read it at one minute, read it at two minutes, read it at the end of milking, and how long did it take to milk? So then you can calculate these numbers. And you don't need to do that many cows, but what's your average in your herd? And then when we think about gently, we want to avoid pain to the cows. So from an equipment point of view, we want to make sure that we have adequate pulsated performance and that our vacuum level has been set along with the performance of the pulsators to the inflations that are being used in the parlor. There's not one setting for pulsation and vacuum level for all liners. So work with your equipment supplier and say, okay, how do we, how do we fine tune my system to minimize uh, any pain or damage to T-dens based on the kind of liner that I have. So if we look at how quickly cows should milk, the first 25 pounds of milk in any milking should be four minutes or less, and each additional 10 pounds of the same milking would add a half a minute onto that. So if we had a cow that was milking 35 pounds of milk, or a pen of cows milking 35 pounds of milk, we'd like to see them milk out in four and a half minutes or less. That's the game plan. And then completely, we want to harvest that available milk. So what I do is I use a strip cup. And at the end of milking, what I'm going to do is, as soon as the unit comes off that cow, I'm going to go back onto the cow, hand strip the cow into a measuring cup, and I'm going to look for two things. I'm going to look at the volume of milk produced from all four teats, and I'm also going to look at the resistance that those cows offer to me when I strip the teats. So if we're not over milking cows, there's going to be minimal resistance. In other words, a cow may pick her foot up and move a little bit once in a while, but most cows will readily allow you to strip their teats without kicking it. It's when we get a lot of kicking, and most of the time then, we have very minimal amounts of milk volume. In other words, less than 15 to 20 mils and a lot of resistance. Then we know the detaches are not set right. And the proper way to set detaches is, is to be in the barn at milking time with a strip cup and say, okay, are the cows milked out effectively or not? And so in this picture, here I am in a, in a rotary parlor, and I'm stripping a cow. And there's a couple things wrong with this picture. And, and I don't know if we can do it or not, but if you see anything wrong in this picture, let's, can we do one of those things? I think, Jim, we can have people write back in. If you see anything wrong in this picture, write it back in, and, and we'll do a little survey and see what happens. But there are, look at our little milk. This is a 50 milliliter mark. There's probably 20 mils. And notice also that this cow's left foot is, up, is coming back at me. So I'm stripping the cow, and she's kicking. So we've got less than 25 mils of milk. We've got a cow that's kicking. The detacher thresholds can be safely increased on this dairy without causing any loss in milk yield. And remember, whenever you make changes to the detacher thresholds, the goal is always this. You maintain or increase the amount of milk on a per cow basis or on milk shipped from the dairy and milk quicker. Because if you do those things, we're going to minimize time and low flow at the end of milking, which remember is high vacuum time, and that's the time we do most damage to teat ends. And that's the time that cows remember, because if we do that consistently, then they don't come into the parlor as well, because they remember that when they're in that parlor, you put this machine on them that hurts them. Yes, we have a couple so of people commenting. So we need rapid milk flow. Gloves. Ah, that's exactly right, because that's the thing I wanted them to hear. I wanted them to see, and we should be wearing gloves. And, and it's amazing to me when I use that slide how few people actually see that. So that's a good. That's that's good that we're seeing that people are. Uh, notice that. So when we talk about rapid milking, and I threw this slide in because it, it you know, we want that initial excellent uh, letdown and continuing letdown, and we get that with excellent, consistent under prep and unit alignment. We want rapid flow for the entire time, you know, minimal unit on time. That begins with great under prep and prompt removal, and avoid over milking. That begins with excellent under prep to avoid over milking at the front end. So the take-home message with this slide is excellent utter prep always makes things better on your dairy, and you need to figure out how to get it done properly. 10 to 12 seconds of contact time, put the units on 90 seconds or later 
thereafter. And then Steve Stewart came up with this years ago, looking at you know power efficiency measures. And to me, the milk per st or pounds of milk per stall per hour is a very valuable piece of information. And you don't need meters to do this. All you need to do is to know how long it takes to milk, how much milk was totally harvested during that milking, and then how many units were used. And so if you look at what we're trying to do with this, we're trying to get cows through the parlor and milk high-producing cows and then have them exit the parlor and another cow calmly enter. So goals, actually what is more important is what is it on your dairy? And I look at it on a, not only on a shift-by-shift -shift basis, but oftentimes on a pen-by-pen -pen basis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little later in the presentation. So I think this is an extremely important part. So what do we want? We want clean hands, clean units, clean platforms, clean cows. And what do we have? You know, in this particular part, it was done in the dead of winter, but the protocol says begin at, as soon as the cows exit, begin at the cow entrance, move towards the front of the parlor, washing the units. This is after every pen of cows. And there's a germicide. It's in the water. Now, the germicide's probably most important for the fact that we are now going to have the sudsing and cleaning action from the germicide that helps wash away cow manure. And then at the end of milking, how do you clean your units? Both of these farms are using a, a wash sink on wheels that they can push down, thoroughly scrub the units, and then put them into the jetta cups. Mm -hmm. And then do we have, have a squeegee in the barn? If we have a squeegee, we can move away cow manure. In this particular parlor, every side of cows, they scrape any manure that's away from underneath the cows. That's part of their protocol. Their people think clean during milking. Here's an automated faucet. So you touch the button, it's going to run for eight seconds. It's a way to wash hands frequently or wash your gloves frequently during milking. Many dairies install these. They're relatively expensive, but it makes it easy to be clean. And how about the convenience of having teak dip brought into the parlor? I mean, you could say there's a couple things wrong with this picture as well, but overall we're now bringing pre and post dip in in a way that's very convenient for the milk harvest technicians. Here's another dairy. Same type of a dairy, but we're bringing it in with stainless valves, stainless piping, and then I was at a dairy recently and took this picture. So this right here is a 19-gauge needle. And I'll tell you, they're using a 19-gauge needle to open the bleed hole in the claw. And if they're doing that, they're going to have some real issues with drilling out the hole in the claw, which is going to lower the peak milk flow claw back. Does your dairy have the right cleaning tool to clean either the bleed hole or the holes in the vents on your liners if they should get plugged during milking? Many dairies rely on a needle, and the right size needle is a 25 gauge or, or smaller, which is an extremely small needle, which veterinarians typically don't have on their truck. There is a 25 gauge needle that can be used. And then look at the, the liner life. The liner on the left had been used, this was on a, recently on a dairy in Canada, had been used for 60 days, which was 1,200 milkings, but it milked three times a day, so it had 180 wash cycles. Here's a brand new liner. Look at the difference in length, and it's all within the shell. So if you overuse liners on your dairy, what you're going to find is that, that, that toward the end of the life of the liner, there's more liner squawks, which propel milk and milk droplets back into teats on other teats, and you're going to find an increased incidence of new mastitis and slower milking. So there's two reasons. If you overuse liners for too many milkings, or in this case, wash cycles, and I tell people no more than 90 wash cycles ever, so if you're less than that and you still see a difference when you change liners, it may be that the chlorine levels are too high on your wash cycle, so they should be evaluated to, de to determine that they're not, the chlorine level is not too high. So let's look at something we can do in all parlors. So milk hoses. Two, this is the same cow, same parlor. And what happened is by moving the hose to the level position from this was anomaly we moved it to this position, it increased the vacuum a half an inch in the claw. So I made a recording. You can see the, the uh, transponder stuck into the claw here. We made a recording. It was, say, 12 inches. When we lifted it like here, it went to 12 and a half. We dropped it immediately back to this, made another measurement, went right back to 12. That means if it's 12, 12 and a half, and 12, the cow's flow rate didn't change. Cutting the milk hose off will improve part of performance. Here's another dare. You can see the milk path goes down and up to the back flush valve. When I hold it over like this, this particular cow goes up three-tenths of an inch. Take-home message, go home, shorten your milk hoses. Many dairies have them long, like these two dairies, so they can milk the problem cow that doesn't turn completely into the parlor right, the short load at the end of the, at the, end of the pen. 
or if a heifer moves too far forward in a stall, but all you have to do is have another short section of milk hose with a nipple in it. You could pull the hose off in this particular barn right here, put the extra hose length in and milk those cows. Because most dairies are set up to milk 98% of their cows wrong, so they can milk 2% of the cows right. I'd rather set the dairy to milk 98% right, and that way we only have to milk 2% wrong. Another example of an uphill milk path that's going to create a tremendous vacuum drop, which is going to slow milking. So shorten milk hoses. And then look at the condition of the hoses. Oftentimes we have kinks or crevices like this. Here we have an example of a dairy where it was on the left, what it happened to on the right. This took a significant amount of time. I'm talking almost six tenths of a minute off of milking on the dairy when we did this per cow. Pinch hoses that are bad. And look, at here's a dairy I was at recently. This is what all the hoses look like. We cut some hoses off, and we need to roll the sensor just a little bit. But you see how much less milk hose goes uphill? And when milk hose goes uphill like this, it causes a vacuum drop. At the end of milking, it's still going to be, if the line vacuums 13 inches down here, it'll be 13 inches here. But if we add this path during peak milk flow compared to this path, this cow will milk faster. And then maintenance issues. We want to look at what we're doing for gaskets. We want to look at plugs in pulsators. Here's an example of a dairy with 6,900 milkings a day, and they're using 30 units, <clears throat> so there's 115 cows per unit, 230 cows at risk every day. How many cows do you put at risk on your dairy every day, or would you put at risk? A good maintenance program. So we think about how it works on a dairy. You know, assume, assume that, it, that it, when the dairy is milking and washing, it's going 60 miles an hour down the road as a pickup. Look at the numbers. At five hours a day, it's 109,000 miles a year. 10 hours a day, it's 219. 22 hours, it's 481,000. What about the maintenance? You know, the most important parts of maintenance, the pulsation system and the milk path components, the milk hoses, the shutoff devices, the meters, the sensors, the gaskets that are there. Maintain those on, on a regular schedule. And here's just an example of what we would put onto a dairy to say, here's the kinds of things you want to do. And you can review this and look at it, but it's the short air tubes, the liners, and the claws. Does somebody check those every milk? You know, what's the vacuum level? Does someone look at the vacuum level on your system every day? And then a lot of dairies simply put fingers into the, into the units when they turn them on and say, does it feel like normal pulsation? Now, that's not a great test, but at least it'll point out the one that's full of manure. And then we look at the other things on here, and these are things to work out, you know. Basically, what I say is to, you know, work, look at this list, work it out with your dealer, and then have a written plan with a budget. What's it going to cost you to maintain your milking equipment for a year? And then put a maintenance calendar on the, in the office or in the parlor. So we write down the dates and the tasks that need to be done. They're checked off when they're done, either by someone on a dairy or by a technician from the milk and equipment company. And then put the settings of your equipment. What are the detacher thresholds? What are the pulsator settings? Oh, what's the vacuum level? Supposing your variable speed goes out in the middle of the night. Technician comes to the dairy. How's he going to know how to set the vacuum level? These are things that are pretty important. And then when I look at it, it's the goal of, you know, the system analysis goal program should be that the equipment's working well. So when you do have an outbreak of mastitis, you don't call your dealer to come look at the milking equipment. You say, okay, our milking equipment's okay because my program's good enough to tell me it is. Why are my cows got more bugs on their teats when they're coming into the parlor? That's the program. So we look at cows. What do they look like? How clean are the udders in your dairy? Are they one, two? ones and twos or threes and fours. And then the filter socks, what do they look like? Do you hang them up after every milking? Do we put them out where people can review them? This is a great scorecard. You can see that the third shift on this dairy has got some issues. And then I was on a dairy recently. Look what's going on. They wash the system with a clean filter. Then they rinse that filter off and use it for milking. And I'm telling people, don't do that. Filters are cheap. Use them. And then score the teat ends. One, two, three is a four. One's nothing, two's a little pre-dip, three's a little manure, and four's a lot. Hopefully your most of your cows are one to twos. And then I see dairies where this is the right rear teat. And you can see each one of those is an alcohol pad on a white towel, how dirty the teat ends actually are. Then think about this. If you want to motivate change in the dairy, find a way to keep score. So here's a really good dairy. Down here we have the three filter, filter socks and the three shifts. This is the parlor performance reports from the parlor. This is a a bulk tank culture that comes back once a week. And this right here is a printout from the dairy plant that gives them the somatic cell count, bacteria counts, and it comes every week. And then you, what this dairy does is they look at some of the things. They highlight 
you know, cows per hour. They want to know what that is. But look at 34 pounds of milk. This is three times a day dairy. You know, they're getting average eight pounds per minute. Remember, six and a half is good. 4.4 minutes for 34 pounds. They're getting 18 pounds in the first two minutes, more than that 14 and a half for a 3x dairy. And notice that they write those with a colored marking pen to highlight it for the milk harvest technicians. So if you're going to monitor your parlor, pick things that the, that the technicians have control over. So average flow, average duration, these are things you can get if you have meters. But remember, all dairies can calculate the milk per stall per hour. Figure it out for each shift every day and post it. Because if you don't post it, you're not keeping score. And if you want to motivate change, keep score. And then do you have a milk harvest technician call list? Which cows are the biggest problem for the cows to milk in that barn? Or the people to milk in the barn? And require the technicians to write down the start and the stop times of every pen. Now you have some data to look at, even if you don't have meters. And then do you record the amount of milk produced in each pen or at least for the whole milking? And you know, maybe this is a place to invest some money in an inline meter that would automatic that would calculate that and allow your technicians to write that down if you don't have that available already. So I go to a dairy and what do I find? I find a two-titted cow and one teeth that's huge. What do you think the technician in this barn thinks about this? This cow needs to go to McDonald's. So we keep the people and the cows calm at all times. We minimize delays to entrance, to utter prep. We start prepping cows as quickly as possible. We attach them in a timely manner and we work at milk and duration. In other words, we start with good utter prep, then we adjust the detaches to come off sooner. And we want 4.2 to 4.5 turns per hour in a side-by-side -side parlor. And on rotaries, if it's a larger rotary, 60 or 50 stall, 60 stalls are bigger than 6.7 turns per hour in that. So the other thing we want to think about is how do we minimize management imposition? In other words, what are we doing to cows when we're not letting them be cows? So think about it. Sometimes in parlors we've expanded the curd size, but their holding pen hasn't been increased. How do we go about moving cows effectively there to minimize our imposition on them? Can we minimize the hours they're away from the parlor by doing things differently on the dairy? Go out and look at your parlor and try to work at things to minimize this management imposition. And then this is from John Ferry back in 1993. I was at a dairy and this was posted. But look at the bottom one. Make no changes without first establishing how their effect will be measured. Hopefully, after listening today, there's some things you can go home and look at in your parlor and maybe some things you can record so you can say, okay, I'm going to make a change to my other prep or I'm going to change my detached thresholds. What am I going to look at? Make sure you do that before you make the change so you know whether it worked. And then think about managerial monitoring. What we're trying to do is figure out what can we look at on a dairy every day and what do we evaluate that says, are we effectively milking today? You know, is it broken? If it isn't, then we'll move on. If it is, let's go figure out what it is. But think about this. There's a lot of things on here, but the cow observation, you know, how are the cows coming to the parlor? And we, we're focused on the barn and parlor. What are the, what is the behavior in the parlor? You know, how much manure has been deposited in the parlor today compared to normal? What are the normal numbers, you know? And those are the kinds of things. And I went to a dairy one time, and it's a goofy picture, and it's not real clear, but there's a vent. This is a bomatic liner. And what had happened is that, that the dealer had dropped off the liners in shells, clean shells, and they weren't stretched. And he told the dairyman, you need to pull these in and stretch them before you put them in the parlor. Well, they'd been, I got to the dairy because of a complaint, and I walked in and looked, and within a minute, I'm like, what's wrong with this parlor? And I realized that they weren't pulled, so pulled in. So I turned all the units off. We, the, the technicians and I stretched them in. Within two days, all our numbers came back in the parlor performance. But the point being is go and look. Sometimes there's very simple things on a dairy that are there. And then think about this. Most of the observations that we've talked about here today are made without touching cows. You've got to dedicate the time to doing it, and you've got to avoid the temptation of considering watching cows and walking to dairy and looking at what's going on on your farm, in particular in your parlor, on a daily basis. It's not a waste of time. It's a way that's going to benefit your dairy, and I don't care if it's a very small dairy or a huge dairy. Spending the time in managerial monitoring will improve your performance. Now, do we have any questions today? Dave, that was a wonderful job. This is Steve Larson here at Words. Uh, uh, you cover a lot of ground, and uh, 
in your time and uh, really gave people a lot of food for thought. So, Mike, do you have some questions there? Yeah, we do. Can you, uh, Dave? Can you go to click to the next uh, PowerPoint first, please, uh, so we can uh, recognize uh, our sponsor? If you can click that at this point, and uh, Steve. That one. There we go. Thank there you. we go. Yep, that's it. Uh, very good. Uh, yeah, a question on the injection of oxytocin. Uh, uh, what, what's your feeling on injecting oxytocin into cows and those that don't want to let milk down? Well, what I tell people is that if you have an animal that doesn't let down properly, in many cases it could be an animal with mastitis or an injury to a cheat, if you use one cc per milking intramuscularly, that can be effective. If you use more than two cc's for several milkings, they can actually, quote, get hooked on it like a drug addict. So you've got to be careful that you don't give too much. Uh, and it can be used in particular in mastitis cows because it will help uh, re get that cow, or to help that cow to achieve a good letdown so she can milk completely out. I'm not against it at all. Just make sure that it's done with one cc. So I typically use tuberculin syringes that only have one cc. I very felt uh, very frequently we'll see people using a 3cc and pretty soon it's a little's good a lot's better so if you give them one syringe that only holds one cc it works better uh, do you have any percent uh, another question do you have any percent of cows uh, if you start seeing more than that one cc if you're injecting more than what two percent of cows is, is there a guideline that says uh, that there's a problem on the farm more than a problem with the cow yeah, if you have many cows that you have to inject oxytocin with, I, I would suspect that there's an issue either with the cow handling, the other prep, or it could be equipment issues that are causing significant pain to the cow. So if you have many cows, and it, maybe it's 2 to 3%, if there's any more than that, there's probably some issue creating that that's, that's more important than, uh, you know, pain in the teeth. Uh, another question on, on cows that come in parlors and they're stimulated and they're squirting milk. And we'll see that at our U University of Illinois herd. Uh, cows are just literally squirting milk. Does that mean that you've got an excellent letdown or we, we should put the machine on quicker? It's only been 30 seconds and we have cows squirting out all four teats. Uh, pr pr pretty uh, st steady streams. Uh, how do you interpret that? Okay, what I tell people is that it, many times, in particular in 2x dairies or dairies that have an interval, maybe a longer interval, I see it in Canada and some other places that. Where, where there's a, you know, maybe it's a 10 and a 14 hour interval or something. It, it, those cows walk in with a lot of milk and just that movement, and particularly when they want to come in and they move fairly quickly into the parlor, and if you put rubber down, then that rubbing action actually gets that cow to having some milk stream and out of her. But in many of those cows, they still really don't have true milk letdown. So if you try to attach units quickly to them, you're going to get into that probably, they may not continue to have good flow for the whole front end of milking. So you may have some high vacuum milking right there at the beginning. I would argue that if it's my dairy, I'm going to prep all cows the same way, uh, unless there's a real good cause that I know I got an individual cow that milks extremely slowly. Maybe I put it on her right away. Other than that, I want all the cows handled in a consistent manner at every milking. Dave, uh, a lot of us end up grouping our cows sort of by stage of lactation, whether it's nutrition or or whatever's going on. When different strings of cows, would you? Uh, use uh, consider a different prep lag time on cows of uh, say the early the fresh cow strings versus the uh, mid lactation and tail enders. Well, you know, there's some dairies that do that. The problem you have is how do you can how do you convey that in a way to the milk harvest technicians so that in certain pens they do things certain diff different ways. So what I tend to do is to work at it and say, and, and this is probably the evolution of this at least 90 seconds from start of stimulation to attachment that when I do it at 90 seconds or slightly longer, then probably some of my real fresh cows I could have put on a few seconds earlier, but they're going to have a good flow. And if I've done that for the whole lactation, those cows that are far out days in milk are still going to let down reasonably well, so we're going to minimize the, the dry milking at the front end of milking. So I, again, consistency in my mind is the key factor, and you drive that across all cows on all pens at, at every milking. Dave, uh, we still have a lot of people listening in, but since uh, we're nearing the end of our assigned uh, hour slot here, I wanted to uh, thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Covered a lot of ground with a lot of things that a lot all of us need to think about uh, out in the parlor or the or the barn to share with uh, coworkers, employees, uh, clientele, whatever. Uh, we also want to. Uh, Thank our friend, uh, people at Marielle for their sponsorship their, uh, with their Best in Class uh, Dairies program. And uh, we want to call your attention to the fact that uh, our next webinar 
will be April 9th, uh, presented by Mike Hutchins, as you can see on the screen there. Uh, Elenco is going to be sponsoring that, and uh, Mike is going to be talking about feed additives. Uh, we all want to uh, remind our, our uh, listeners that in a few days you might receive a very short uh, question uh, survey regarding the, the uh, webinar today. Just take a few seconds to fill that out. We appreciate your input that on that to help us keep uh, our webinars on target. And then the other thing is that this webinar and all the others that we've had before can be accessed on the webinar archives going by going to forge.com rather and uh, following the prompts to our webinar series. And you can go back and at no charge, of course, uh, listen to any of these uh, webinars that we've presented before. Mike? Yep, I, I think, Steve, uh, that wraps it up uh, in pretty good shape at this point. Uh, we, Unless we have any other questions, I've not uh, seen any on the screen. I have one more question here over here, and it says, uh, David, would you expect any difference with jerseys versus Thorstein and some of these milking rates? We saw some 2x3 differentials you gave us. Anything on breeds? In terms yes, of there is. It, it, typically, that jersey is going to be lower than that. Uh, what you'll find on a jersey is that if we looked at the average flow per minute, typically it's going to be in the mid to upper fives on a herd basis. Maybe the best pens can make the six and a half, maybe a pen that's at, uh, you know, at, at 28, 29 pounds three times a day. So yeah, there is a breed difference, and these are basically for Holsteins. And remember, I, I, I put them out as, I don't really want to call them goals, I just want to say that there are these kinds of numbers I can see on many dairies. The most important numbers are what is it on your dairy now? And as you make changes, what happens to that? So whether it's a Jersey herd or a Holstein herd, what is it today? And if you make a change, then what happened to the performance? So in other words, did you make the same amount or more milk? And many dairies forget that, this good out of prep is a way to maximize your milk production so that, you know, prep your cows better and if you got another half pound or a pound of milk a day per cow, that's a pretty good raise at the end of the month. Okay. Um, we, we aren't seeing any more questions here. Jim Balt said there are questions, but we, we don't see them here. Um, Dr. Hutchins, are you looking under the questions tab? Yeah, we're trying to. Uh, Patty's we're we're working on it here, so uh, well here I'll I'll start reading them. Um, okay, go ahead, Jim. Doctor Reed, is there a condition okay. in cows that does not let there be milk let down without oxytocin? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch what that was, Jim. Is there a condition in cows that does not let milk let there be milk let down without oxytocin? Uh. Not that I know of. I mean, anything that upsets the cow, she has an adrenaline release, that will override the oxytocin. But, uh, you know, the, the oxytocin itself is a physiological fact, so the cow typically would have it. I don't know of a cow that doesn't have it. Okay. Uh, so, Jim, what are your recommendations for training fresh or soon to be fresh in heifers? Okay, if I had my choice, the, the way to train animals before calving is to have them into the parlor or into the barn. And so many cases, if you have a little downtime, turn them into the holding pen, open up all the gates and let them expose it on their own. Maybe put a couple cows in there to help help them lead through. Uh, do that for a couple days. And then maybe later in the week, try to actually bring those animals through the parlor. And in fact, in some cases, we actually apply a post dip, we just put some post dip on them, just so they're used to being in that parlor and they've seen what it is before they actually have that calf and move in there to be milked. Okay. What do you think Dave, about Dave, using the for slide. Tea dip? Dave, put the next slide up. Dave, just move the slide one more time back to the sponsor sponsor slide. Okay. See if I can get it here. How there? Okay. Got to keep me on the straight and narrow, Mike. Okay, Jim. We're all set. What about foaming? Uh, foamers for for di for tea dips. What's your opinion of foamers? Uh, pre dip. It's a great way to put pre dip on. Uh, the other side of it is that foaming will use four to six mils of. Uh, a pre-dip per application per cow. Uh, it marks the cow extremely well, and because it's foam, it's 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 you've got the mixture of the pre-dip and air. The foam is a really good wetting agent, so it wet, wets the teat really well, and it really does aid in removing organic matter that may be dried on teat. So foaming, in my mind, is an excellent way to go. Most of the current pre-dips will foam pretty well. If not, there are variations that you can buy that will foam very well to give you a shaving cream cream type foam on the teats. 
Okay, David, we're in a speed round now. Here we go. What about okay. dirt on otters when flaming? Must must must, must they be dirt free before you can flame them, or you can flame them if there's manure on uh, dried manure on the teeth? On the I teeth. typically I typically use a gloved hand or, or curry comb and just rub anything dry off, and do it on days when the humidity is low. Never do it in the morning. Always do it in the afternoons for typically most of the U.S. But you do it, rub off any dried organic matter if you can, or take a curry comb to them before you fire them. Okay, here's a longer one. What's the easy solution to fix teed end condition in a herd? And 70% of them were scored three or four with a uh, low somatic cell count. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> okay, so sure, the low somatic cell count means that the, the dairy does an excellent job of maintaining teats with minimal bacterial numbers. But there's some probably mechanical aspects going on. So it's either vacuum level too high or too low, pulsation rates and ratios, or Detach with thresholds that are just too dry and we're grossly over milking cows. So it's going to be some mechanical impact of the pressure that's put on those teats by the milking equipment. But the fact that they're low cell count means that they're just very clean. However, that dairy is a dairy that if they fix the, the incident or the reasons why the teats are damaged, they'll go up and milk. So there's a real reason to go fix that dairy. Absolutely. We have another question on L. Bovis, uh, brevis to treat environmentals. Does that make sense to you? Uh, the L uh, I'm having a trouble with that one. <laughs> I'm not sure what they're saying, sir. Another question is, what do you think about uh, Paul Ravnick B's uh, theory on uh, stockmanship? <laughs> Very excellent. And Paul and I have had some great discussions. And you know, there there are people now saying that if we have the right trained individual to be to move cows properly into the parlor, especially in a large dairy, we may be better off when than using a crowd gate. And I won't argue that. Uh, you know, the only the main difference between Paul and I is that I'll shield the entrance areas of the parlor that the where the cows can't see the people, and I do that because oftentimes the manufacturers put the crowd gate controls at that end of the parlor. And, you know, Paul says, ah, the cows should see in there. And other than that kind of a minor minor disagreement between us, I'd say that, you know, absolutely the, the, the more stockmanship that is taught to people that work on dairies, the calmer the cows are going to be and the better the overall milk production and profitability will be. Uh, David, what do you think of the, the pull system for cleaning cows? Your opinion, please. The pull system, P-U-L-L, -L, pull system. Does that make sense to you? No, I'm not sure what that means either, so I'd have to pass. Yeah, maybe it's something like the teach scrubbers. Oh, it might be. And, you know, the teach scrubbers can get you contact time. You know, the issue becomes is that, you know, how clean are the teats and are you getting a teat end well? But, again, you know, the, there's no one right way to milk cows. So, you know, the, I went briefly through some, some ways to prep, but it's 10 to 12 seconds of contact time and having the teats clean enough and hopefully dry enough that when you put the unit on, the liner's not going to search and squawk. It's going to seat on the teat and milk uh, correctly right from the beginning. But there's no one right way to get there. There's lots of ways to prep cows that will arrive at, you know, at stimulated teats when your units are applied. David, we had a question about all co-pulsation systems. Okay. So it's a, it's a pulsation system uh, out of New York. Uh, basically, it's single shot, milks all four teats at once. Uh, so you have twice as much milk in the milk hoses and that. Uh, my opinion would be that that's not the right way to go, although people can use that system and make it work. Uh, again, there's no one right way to milk. There's lots of different variations on equipment out there, uh, but I'm not convinced that it will solve all of the teat end issue problems that uh, sometimes it's advocated that it will. Last question, David. Uh, what do you think of uh, herds that do no, uh, no force stripping and then what about double dipping, uh, two, two modifications of your protocol? Well, you know, if you have enough contact time on the teach and you don't strip, that they can still milk okay. But the issue then is, how do you detect sub, you know, clinical mastitis? How do you detect bad milk? And and you know, and, and the, so that's an issue. But can you get by without stripping? Absolutely. You can do manipulations of the teat and washing the teat and drying the teat and get them stimulated. Now, on many dairies, when I when I'm working on dairies that uh, have a conventional kind of a protocol, dip, strip, dry, and apply. You know, many times what we'll do is if that passage rate is to go to the cow, rub, rub the, with the backside of the glove to remove any organic matter, you know, dried shavings or bedding, then we apply post-dip and we strip and rub the end of the teat. In a lot of dairies, we re-dip those cows at that point. Then we go do, say we're doing a four or five cow group, we come back, 
we dry all four or five, then we come back and attach. So the double dipping, you know, in particular if a herd has a situation where uh, something breaks and they get into, they can't haul the manure or they get, the cows get dirtier than normal. Maybe it's a rainstorm in a dry lot dairy and that sort of thing. Oftentimes we'll go to a double dipping when they're in that problem condition because by applying pre-dip, then stripping, you actually remove some of the pre-dip. So if you go back and re-dip that cow after you've stripped her and rubbed her teat ends, what you'll get is a much better kill and you'll have enough moisture when the, when the next technician comes to dry that the teat can be dried with that one circular motion. So it's a real positive thing in a lot of dairies. Okay. Dave, we're going we're gonna to stop with that and thank you again for a wonderful presentation. You covered a lot of ground. We're keeping you over time, but a lot of uh, listeners have stayed with us to uh, hear what you have to say. We appreciate it. And again, we thank Mary Ellen, their best in class program. Uh, remind our listeners, uh, the next webinar is going to be April 9th. Mike Hutchins will be talking about feed additives, and that's going to be brought to us by Elanco. So thanks for your participation and your attendance. Well, I, I enjoyed it as well, so hopefully we get some good out of it. Thanks again.